Hey, howdy everyone. What I'm going to do with this lecture right now is do a walkthrough on the area of representativity with a spatial data set. Specifically, how do we treat a data set that's been preferentially sampled in the high locations in space and get it so that we're able to, well, number one, detect that that's a problem, and number two, be able to go ahead and mitigate for that problem. And so we're going to cover that topic specifically on cell-based declustering. Now you might be interested in seeing the actual theory and lecture materials. They are part of a lecture in my graduate level course that I'm conducting right now, but they're also available in on my YouTube channel. Specifically, look at this video right here. 9C Geostatistics course Spatial Bias should provide you with all of the background that you need before watching this walkthrough of the code. Because in this walkthrough, I'm going to cover all of the associated theory. We're just going to run the code, make observations, and so you'll want to do that as a prerequisite to be able to follow along. So let's go ahead. We'll get started here. This is a Jupyter Notebook. I have put a couple of fields up front, as I try to nowadays, which have a little bit of a description, a little bit of a discussion about the theory. Specifically, I talk about how you would set in a representative manner and so forth, and then talk about the idea of declustering. Now, with all of our workflows that we developed in Python, we always started off by importing the packages that we need in order to complete the workflow. To do the declustering, we're going to need the GeostatPy package, and so we'll import it. We have two components of GeostatPy package. We have the visualization utilities and re basically an effort to wrap some of the GeostLab code. The issue around wrapping is becoming kind of a moot point nowadays because we're reaching a point where the second component of the package, the re-implementation of all of the numerics from GeostLab into the second component, is reaching the point where it's pretty mature. You're able to do much of what we need to do directly with that. So that's good. We're doing everything in Python now. And so we'll go ahead and run that. You'll notice if you're new at this that uh, it's running right now when the circle is full, indicating that it was processing that command. It's done. No errors. So it means that the package, it worked. I, I'm not surprised. Well, I'm not. It, 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 I knew it would work. Pretty sure it was going to work. So now we're, gonna, we're going to go ahead and import all of the other packages. Now, one thing you'll notice about my philosophy is I tend to use the most common packages, the ones that are available in Anaconda. I try not to get into really exotic packages because I want the workflows to be available, to work, to not have issues around compatibilities with updates and so forth. So we we'll go ahead and we'll load those. We'll get NumPy for working with our gridded data, Pandas for working with tabular data, OS so we can set working directories, interact with the operating system, and matplotlib for plotting, and scipy if we want to do some statistics. We're going to set a working directory. I always like to set a working directory. Uh, the main reason is otherwise I just lose files. I can't find where they went. I'm not sure where things got written out. And it also simplifies if I want to write files out, I can just give the name of the file rather than having to put the entire directory in the command. And often I'll work between multiple directories. I like to control the flow of information between all the directories and the more complicated workflows that I'll build. So we'll go ahead and run that command. If you, This would be the one line that you need to change to wherever you put the data file that we're going to work with. And what is that data file? That data file is this file right here. It's just a basic CSV file, not a big deal. If you want to find out where to find all of the data files that I have, I will go ahead. I'm stalling now a little bit. Because on the other screen, I'm navigating. And so I'm navigating to, in my, Python, in my GitHub account, I have my geo data sets, which has a whole bunch of spatial data sets that I use within my examples. And so this one is right here. And you can go ahead and download it there in order to carry out this example. You put it in the working directory, and you run this line of code, and you don't get an error because it loaded it up. Now what happened, I love pandas because it goes ahead, has one really simple command, reads comma delimited files, CSV files, reads it in from the original ASCII comma delimited format into a data frame that's now known as DF. And so it looks good, it loaded, there was no error. Now we can go ahead and 
take a look at it. Make sure it did load. Anytime you work with data, you load data, you want to perform some checks. Look at the data, visualize the data, and so forth. So two different ways we can print a slice from the data set. Look at the first five rows and for all of the variables. That's all I did by doing that. Or the built-in head command, which is um, built into data frames, allows you to preview the first n rows. And I said n13, my favorite number. And we can look at a very nice clean table and see what the data looks like. And we're in good shape. It, it loaded appropriately. We're good to go. Got x, y, and we're going to work with porosity in this example right here. Now, we also want to run some summary statistics. Data frames has a describe function built into it that allows you to look at all the summary statistics all at once with one quick command. Very useful. Now, I like to transpose it. We're just flipping the columns and the rows so that we can see the actual sample statistics in the columns and the variables in the rows. You could, you could do either way, whatever you're comfortable with. Not a big deal. In fact, if you just got rid of this command and reran it, you see exactly what I mean. Not a, it's just what you like. All right, and then we're going to, because it's a spatial problem, we have to determine what's the area of interest. What is the specific X and Y extents that we want to work with? And we should probably specify a min and max value for the porosity for the purpose of printing or visualizing and the color bar. And we'll also want to specify the color bar. And I know there was some good discussions, Matt Hall and Agile Geoscience, all those folks with a bunch of other people on Twitter about color bars and color blindness. And my understanding is that a plasma color bar is okay, I hope. I hope I got that right, because the intensity and the tone vary together. Uh, I, I probably missed some of the finer details of that scientific topic, but we'll run that, and I think it's okay. Now we're going to look at a location map. Now you, one of the things you'll notice in GSLive within GeostatPy, the GSLive component, is I've tried to either wrap or re-implement some of the well, I wrap the numerics or I try to re-implement some of the basic visualizations using the same parameters you use in GeoSlide, which have the same look and feel. That's really just a kind of a bridge to help my students not get hung up. They uh, kind of very intuitive one-line type of plotting commands, which are very general, and um, they lose flexibility, of course, but really underneath the hood, it's just using matplotlib anyway. So if you want to have more flexibility, you could just use that. But I think this is a good bridge to get people plotting in Python who are brand new and specifically people used to GSLive, which many people over the years, of course, use GSLive. It's widely been used. And so it'll help people they're familiar with it. So you run that command, you'll see exactly what the parameters are. We're just saying, hey, what are your parameters? Just tell us what your parameters are. And we can see them right there. And we can set them with our data set. No problem at all. Very straightforward. The one thing that I've added that might add a little bit of complexity is at the very end here, you're able to specify a name of a file. And by default, the program will save out a high resolution file in a TIFF format, file format, 300 dots per inch, ready for publication. I thought that was a nice little touch to just kind of have that write out. Of course, simple command once you build the figure to just write, the, write it out by yourself. Just take a look at the source. You'll see how it's done. So we can go ahead and run that line of code, and we got a nice visualization. Plasma color scale, low to high porosities, and look at the data. It's pretty cool, actually. I like it. Two-dimensional data set, y and x meters, one kilometer by one kilometer. And if you look at it here, what you'll see is very interesting. Is in a location, can you see the pattern? Kind of high values, medium values, medium values, but high here. In the higher locations, there's clearly a pattern of higher density of samples. So we are biased high. I think we can all accept that right now. In the lower locations, the lower areas, we have uh, sparser samples. So clearly we're going to be biased too high. In addition to that, if you look, it's interesting. You can see some clusters of samples. And then at a certain scale, they become less clustered. And I would suggest somewhere around 100, 200 meters if you had a window of 100 meters, you could encapsulate the clusters or 200 meters, somewhere around that. That's important. That visual interpretation is going to help guide us as far as what we get from cell-based clustering. I'll show you how that can help us decide on the cell size. Well, we're going to run the dcluster program now. So let's go ahead. We run just the command to see what the parameters are. Looks pretty straightforward. I'll just make a couple of comments here, and you can go back to the lecture notes to get more details. 
the data frame x and y, the variable that we want to work across. So far, so good, not a big deal. I min max one, we're telling the program to pick the cell size that minimizes the declustered mean. We suspect that we're biased high, so we put one. If it was the other way around that we were biased low, we would put that as zero for the automatic detection of cell size. Number of offsets, we know that the declustering cell-based declustering method is sensitive to the precise location of the mesh. And so we're going to go ahead and have random perturbations on the mesh, boom, 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 in order to average the results and remove the influence of the mesh location. Then we're going to have a number of cells. We'll say 100. They run fast. That's a small problem. You can do 1,000. It doesn't matter. We just want to visualize and understand the problem. 100 is enough. We're going to go from very small cell sizes to very large, twice the extent of the area of interest. Let's just blow it right up. Just go really big cell sizes. And that's totally fine. We can, we can do that. And it'll be good. It'll be instructive. Okay, so this will run pretty quick. We're going to then also take the weights, which come out as a one-dimensional array in the same order as the data, conveniently, and we can append it to our data frame. So now we have porosity and porosity weights. So let's go ahead and run that command. It should not take very long at all. It gives us some summary statistics, and it's done. So we have weights, we have porosity, and so it worked. Well, we should check it. We should take a look and see what's happened here. The first thing you could do is you could create a location map of the weights. That's a very good thing to do. Let's just see if they're rational. Let's see if they make sense. So we're just plotting that weight column, which is the weights for porosity. And let's go ahead and take a look and see what that looks like. What do you see here? You see that the lowest weight is in the locations of the densest samples. The highest weight are in the locations of the most sparse sampling. It looks like we've done a pretty good job. There's nothing irrational about our declustering weights. We can feel pretty comfortable about them. Now let's go ahead and plot a whole bunch of diagnostic plots to understand what we've done. Let's, let's see the output. So let me plot them and we'll go ahead and talk through what we have. Okay, so here's the plots. Let's start here. The declustered weights location map. Good, we already talked about that. We're fine. The, declustered, the declustering weights distribution. That's very instructive. We can see overall the range of values. I know we have some values that are a little bit higher than this. I saw a three on that previous table up here. So they can go a little bit higher. We might want to look at and expand that distribution and make sure that we've encapsulated all the possible weights. If you're uncomfortable about it, go ahead and rerun it. And look, so we've got a couple that are pretty high, getting up to about four. But in general, centered around, we have quite a few that are around one. One is nominal weight. Those, those are data and locations where they're neither oversampled, undersampled. They have a nominal amount of um, clustering or spacing. It would be the same amount of spacing you'd expect if all the data was equal spaced throughout this entire data set. And we have some high weights, probably from the locations, which are very much on their own. You could look at that. You might be concerned that they're a bit high, but I think it's pretty good. Then what we also have is the original naive distribution. No declustering weights, just raw data frequencies shown here. Histogram, frequencies, porosity values, bars, not a big deal. Then we have the declustered distribution. It's a frequency plot where we've applied weights. The very cool thing about Python and working specifically with matplotlib is the plotting methods for histograms will accept weights directly in. So we can feed our declustering array, our weight array, directly into the histogram program. If you want to see exactly what that looks like, this is it right here. So we're able to go ahead and feed in for the histogram. This is going to be the porosity and this is the weights right here. We, we are going ahead and extracting the weights as a series. If you're concerned about that, you can put the dot values and that would turn it into a one-dimensional ND array. I like to do that, but it's fine. The program will accept the series, so it works okay. So we go ahead and we use the weights, and now let's compare. Let's look at the two distributions right here. Do you see any difference? I see a difference. And the difference I see in general is that if you go from naive to declustered, I see greater height on the bars and the lows and then reduced height on the high side. And that's exactly what we'd expect through weighting when we have biased high, the distributions being adjusted. Now, if you think about a histogram, it's really just taking a bunch of increments 
and adding them together for each one of the bins of specific property intervals. And it's just simply calculating the total height of the bar based on the increments. Now you might wonder what's the increments? Well, it's a histogram here, so it's just frequency. So it's just a number, that's one or two, and then this would be like six, and this might be like 13 or 14 or 15. You see what I'm saying? saying. And if you add one data, it would just go incremental up by one on the frequency scale here. But when you use weights, it uses those weights instead of using one for every single data. So what can happen is this one right here looks like it has a frequency of about maybe three or four, but in fact, it might only be one data with the weight of three or four. You see that? But if you take the total sum of all the weights, it's equal to n, the number of data that we have. So we've actually conserved the volume under the bar chart. We've just shifted the heights of the bars. Do you see any single bar which has moved? Do you see any bars where we can say, yes, a bar has moved to a new, new location? And the answer is no, because the clustering does not change the data values. It can't move the bars laterally. It just changes the weight of the data within the bars, so it can only change the height of the bars, not the locations of the bars. You can't fill in parts of the missing distribution. There's other methods to do that, debiasing the soft data. We're not talking about that today. Now, a very good plot is to look at the declustered mean versus the cell size. Let's see what we actually used. Now, if you think this through, this is the cell size right here from 10 to 2,000 meters. That's what we chose to work with. This is the declustered mean for porosity using the weights to calculate the average. Not a big deal, easy to do. We can see that for a very small cell size, we should have the naive mean. That's because every single data value is within its own cell. They will get a weight of one. Now, at a very large cell size, all the data are in the same cell, and so the weight should go to one again. And so we get back to the naive mean eventually. Now, let's look at what's happening here is as we increase the cell size, we start to drop the declustered mean. It levels out around probably about 150, 200, 250 is still pretty low, and then it starts to slowly rise up. This minimizing cell size, the cell size that provided us with the minimum declustered mean was probably around 200. And if you think back to our original ocular inspection and our estimate based on the cluster sizes within our data set, it was about 1 to 200 meters. It looks like we did a pretty good job. I have to admit, first time I came up with that number, I had not cheated. I had actually looked, and it came. It actually did work. And so that's one way to do it. Now, of course, if you have the data with a regular grid, with a regular spacing, and then you have some local refinements with higher density around certain locations or clusters, you would just simply use the cell size equal to the larger grid spacing for that coarser sampling. All right, I hope that this was helpful for you. Um, as always, I'm happy to share these workflows, this information. There's always um, more information available to you. You can go to my GitHub account, my YouTube channel. I'm the Geostats guy on both. Um, also, Twitter, I share a lot of information about subsurface data analytics, machine learning, geostatistics. And um, yeah, I hope this was helpful. And I welcome any comments or suggestions for future or for revisions on this. All right. Hey, you all take care. See ya.